so the basic story here is that uh, Glimmer 1 was basically an attempt to take a big part of the rendering process of Ember and move it into a separate library that would uh, both be HTML-aware, so before Glimmer, uh, before HTML bars really, Ember was just like string templating all the way and we eventually moved towards a DOM-based story and uh, after HTML bars, Glimmer was really the first engine that took a lot of advantage of that. So it took a lot of advantage of knowing a lot about the uh, where things were in the DOM. Um, and Glimmer 1 had a really good updating story, and the main trick, which people may have observed, they're following for along for a while, the main trick is uh, we, d we have two rendering steps. We have the initial rendering step, which includes all the things, like every element on the page, and the updating step, which is just the part that uh, updates only thing anything that could have changed. So mm -hmm. in the abstract, could have changed. And in fact, Glimmer 1 had a very, even after we integrated everything with Ember, we had really good updating performance. So we got, you p people may have seen a DBmon demo, we got like 10, somewhere between 10 and 100x updating performance improvement. But largely because it was a new code base and also because of some mistakes, we actually uh, got slower on initial render performance initially. Uh, you were actually part of uncovering and helping us to fix that. Uh, so today, I think initial render performance is largely decent compared to before, although a lot of that has to do with how much you use components. So one of the very annoying things about Glimmer 1 is that Glimmer 1 components were pretty expensive compared to other things. So if, if you wrote a program in Ember with no components at all, uh, in, even in Glimmer 1, initial render performance would have been very fast. But when you start using components the way you're supposed to, and you break it down into a lot of little components, Glimmer 1 was slower per component, so it added up. So a big part of Glimmer 2 was basically to sort of take in what we learned from Glimmer 1 and try to build a system that was m more compatible with using a lot of components, making components themselves more or less free or very cheap, considered very cheap. So I think uh, I can show you how I personally dive into it, which yep. is we wrote this thing. It actually looks, I'm on Windows, by the way. Uh, this looks like looks a lot better on o on OS 10 due to the sidebar thing, and I should probably tell Godfrey to I should probably tell Godfrey to take that into consideration when he conti continues to work on this. But this is basically like sort of the uh, bird's eye view of what is happening in Glimmer, and it's probably a good way to like dive into each individual piece. So this is called the Glimmer Visualizer. Um, actually, let me start from the like from the beginning. So. The Glimmer Visualizer basically gives you a place to put in all the data for a particular thing that you're looking at. It gives you, allows you to put in a top-level template, and then uh, it's right now hard-coded to a single component called HCard. And the, as you can see, the component is pretty complicated. Um, and when you press Render, what that does is it does all the compilation steps, and then if you go to the right, what you will see is that it has given, it's shown you the DOM as well as the HTML output of the original rendering process. Now, I think that's pretty cool about this is if I, um, if I, you can edit the data live, so I can basically go in and, you know, delete the contacts, and then if I click update, it will update the output, and you can see that the DOM is now empty. Uh, if you look at the H card code, you can see that um, there's things like if the person has a URL or uh, with the person's name, etc., uh, and basically all of these things are empty, of course, because we have no contacts. Uh, and the top level template, of course, is looping over all the contacts. So basically, because we have no contacts, we have just deleted the entire thing. Um, now, if I put the data back and change it so that, let's say, there, uh, let's say the, so let me re-render actually after putting the data back. And note that this re-rendering happened without. It's not a from scratch re-render. It's a update. But of course, in this case, it's doing a lot of things. Um, if I uh, come back here and change like uh, this to Johnny or something like that, um, what you if I click update. It makes just that small change over here, and you can see the update in the DOM. So uh, I, maybe I should start by giving like a very high-level view of what all the steps are here, and then we can sort of look at the individual details. Sounds good. So at a very high level, each of these templates gets compiled into what we call the wire format. Um, this is actually just a representation of the wire format. The real wire format is a JSON blob, but uh, what you have in the JSON in the JSON blob is a list of statements for the top level, and so uh, if we look at this, what we'll see is that there's an, a thing that says open element of div and close element that corresponds to this div and that closing div. Uh, there's a thing that says static adder, and that basically means this is an attribute that cannot change, and in this case, it cannot change because it has the, it's a string, like literally cannot mm -hmm. change. Um, then there's a piece of text which is the new line, and then Here's an interesting thing. There's a you can see there's a block inside of here. There's a block, and it's in each block. Uh, 
and it takes a parameter which is get the current value of contacts and um, you can see that it has another parameter which is the I key of ID and so what, what this is basically saying is uh, do all that and then the actual contents of the block, the code is the zeroth block and then that, now we have the list of the remaining blocks so here's the other block, you can see that there's some text in here uh, it starts off with a bunch of empty white space but then there's an open element of H card. Uh, there's a dynamic attribute this time. So here we can see that the H card has a person of dynamic content. So that's dynamic attribute of person. Um, unknown basically just means at, at the time that the server compiled this, at the time of pre-compilation, we didn't know exactly what it was yet, specifically whether it was a helper or not. Um, but we can resolve that at, at I'll tell you soon I'll, when we resolve it. Um, and then we close the element, and then there's another open element of just this HR and an immediate close element. So we basically converted the inner block into another block here. If you look at the original code, there's this thing that says as contact, and that means that there's a contact local variable here. Uh, actually, something occurs to me, which I will say in a second. But And so you can see because there's a local variable here called contact, uh, this local you could think of as like parameters. It's like the parameters to this function. The thing that I just noticed, and I think someone's actually working on this, is that in this particular case, because contact is coming from this parameter here, it actually isn't unknown at server side compile time, and it could easily have been converted into something better than that. And yep. I think it happens to be converted in the beginning of runtime, but it doesn't need to be. Yep. And I think someone might already be working on it. I'm not going to go into all the wire format of HCard because it would take a long time, but yep. it's more or less the same thing. There's just more blocks, more locals, whatever. Internally, this is also referred to as a template spec, is that right? It, internally, it's referred to as a template spec. Uh, I think almost all the places where we might refer to it as a template spec, eventually we'll call it a wire format. Right. Um, the reason we call it the wire format, it's basically the first round of in IR, intermediate representation, and the basic idea is that uh, we are doing as much work as we can up front and then converting into something that makes sense to send down to the browser. Um, you could imagine a like online version of all this that wouldn't necessarily need to think of it as the wire format, but because of our architecture, it's it's exactly the thing that goes over the wire. Yeah. Um, and and by the way, these templates, a couple of nice things about this architecture, the templates are much smaller than the uh, original ones which compiled to JavaScript. And also because they're not JavaScript, they are they are just a data structure. And that means that we don't, there's no evaluation initially. So a lot of the wins that we saw from initially starting to roll out Glimmer two into real apps. Uh, came from the fact that we can more easily evaluate these things lazily on demand and do whatever like optimizations you would do on a real programming language and that has been pretty nice. Yeah. So, great. So, I'll keep going for a little bit. I think probably it shouldn't take more than a few more minutes to go through the whole mm -hmm. thing. So, uh, the wire format then get, gets to the browser and the browser has to convert it into something that you can run and the thing that it converts it into is called the opcodes. And the op there's more going on in the opcodes but Basically, there, it, there's a certain amount of, sand of like, you can understand a certain amount of it. So, like, open element of div, for example, becomes open primi primitive element of div. And a primitive element is, like, just the simplest kind of element that you can have. Actually, why don't I just jump in and show you what that, um, what that looks like? I think I won't do it too much in this phase, but I think it's probably good. Open primitive element. Okay, here we go. I got it. Uh, so here's open primitive element opcode and open primitive element opcode. The important thing here is that it is its evaluation method. The rest of it is kind of uh, boilerplate. A lot of it's for debugging, actually. So you evaluate it as a thing that says open an element on the stack. And if I go here, you can see it basically says push new element with this tag and then open the element, which is basically tracking the bounds of that element. So uh, the point is that it becomes a pretty simple operation, which is like the simplest kind of element that you can do. Um, static adder, because it's static, also becomes the simplest thing that you could do, which is just static, a <laughs> thing that matches this, the static attribute opcode. Actually, I can show you that too, it's probably pretty easy, so static adder opcode. By the way, I'm using Visual Studio Code here, mm -hmm. which uh, is taking advantage of the fact that this whole thing is written in TypeScript to make it very easy to jump around. Um, so static adder opcode actually does a little more work, it checks to see if there's a namespace and then decides to run either the namespace version or the non-namespace version, which you don't have to know about, but it's basically about SVG. Right. Um, it's how SVG actually works. So we basically then have set attribute, and we can bas uh, we basically can add an attribute automatically. Um, definitely, deep, you can feel free to deep dive. Every It turns out that DOM is not a totally trivial thing, so almost every one of these things is a little bit more complicated than it looks, but it's actually quite nicely factored. So if you're like, 
I wonder what's weird about attributes. You can actually find out exactly from Glimmer what's going on. Yep. So th that's the easy part. Um, and like I said, text is also. Uh, but once we start getting to blocks, it actually gets less easy. Um, so, and I, I won't get into too much detail, but I, I'll maybe like skim through it. So yep. the first thing that happens here is that we have this thing called enter, which basically means I am entering a area of code. The main reason this exists is so that later on, we can basically, if we need to remove it, we can just nuke the entire thing all at once. And that's, there, there's an internal thing called the block tracker, which is tracking the bounds of all these internal blocks. Um, and then we have a label, which is more or less like usual VM stuff. Uh, the next thing we do is we, put the arguments for the, so the block is saying it's an each and it gets the contacts and then has a key of ID. And this is basically saying, um, put the arguments for self.contacts and uh, with the named arguments of key of ID. So it's basically taking the arguments that you got in and putting them onto this sitting register, putting it into a register. Um, so I mean, th this, is, uh, this is different than anything we've seen before, right? This is a this is a custom VM, it's a custom that's, VM yeah. that's built to draw DOM hierarchies and then update them. And yep. Yeah, so actually there's a great blog post that people should read uh, by Steve Yege. Um, I don't, uh, yes, it's called this thing. And basically the premise of this article, which was written a long, long time ago, but like really got to me when I read it, was compilers and parsers are things that you should know as a programmer because once you know them, you can use them in all kinds of places mm -hmm. and not have to worry about the exact parsers and compilers people have already given you. And this is like a good example of that where we could have done use an existing thing, but being able to write a very custom thing ha has, been able, has allowed us to do optimizations that we, don't, that we wouldn't be able to do against JavaScript. Yeah. Right? So we could emit some JavaScript that would be equivalent to this. You might be thinking like, oh, why don't you just emit JavaScript that already is a programming language? But of course, JavaScript has a lot of semantics that are hard to optimize. And by starting with a very small programming language, which Handlebars is, and writing a VM just for that, we can actually do optimizations, which I'll talk about later, yeah. um, that are custom to the domain, which okay. is good. Uh, yeah, so, so I, when I say it's familiar to VM people, like a lot of these things are very similar to how you would implement a VM. But then occasionally, you'll see opcodes like open primitive element, which you would not, ex maybe in PHP, right? But usually, you'd not expect to see that. Um, I don't think PHP has its architecture, <laughs> but uh, so then we're basically putting the arguments, and then because we had a each an each loop, um, we immediately put an iterator on this uh, in the register, and the next thing we do is we say if the basically if the iterator is empty, we jump directly to the end label, and the end label is forty nine forty one, which is going to be like basically the very end. In this case, there's no else. If there was an each else is a construct in in Glimmer, so you if there was an else, it would jump to the else block. But in this case, there's nothing there, right? So, uh, but if there is something on there, then we call enter list, and that is creating another block that represents just a list. And this is actually pretty similar to like how loop scopes work in JavaScript. So if you have like a for loop in JavaScript, there's like the outer scope, and then there's the inner scope, and then there's another scope per um, per iteration. Mm -hmm. And that's more or less how this works also. And the reason why it has to work like that, the reason we have to care about that in Glimmer is because each of these scopes can go away or be moved, and we need to track the actual DOM bounds so we can move things around over time. Okay. Right. So we're entering the list. Uh, we create, uh, and that's 40, you know, pointing at 4937 to 4938, which is basically here to here. Um, and then we say, uh, here's another label, and then we get the next thing out of, off of the iterator, and we say, okay, we're going to enter with a key, and in this case, the key is going to be the remember that we said has a key of ID, and that basically is going to become the key that we're entering, and those keys, if you're familiar with React, uh, is basically how we know um, how we can move things around efficiently, right? So if, in React, it's used a lot more. In Ember, it's only used for lists, but for lists of things in Ember, every single list item has a key internally, and the key is how we know later on whether to keep it in the same position or move it around or remove right. it or whatever. So this, this isn't a new uh, addition to the handlebar syntax. This is just an internal thing that yes. Ember will fill in. Yes, right. and so in the case of, in the case of the, this visualizer, we're actually supplying a key. In Ember, we default to using the internal GUID that Ember creates for all objects. Um, but you can also, just like in React, specify your own if you're like, I actually don't want it to be based on object identity. It's based on like the username of this thing. You can do that. Okay. And internally, Glimmer just needs some key, and Ember gives it, Ember gives it a default one, and 
you can also give an alternative. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the interesting thing here, the thing that you're getting at is that enter with key is actually a like, deep internal thing about Glimmer. It's not like part of the surface syntax. It's like how lists have to work in Glimmer. Yeah. Um, so then we, now we're about, eventually about to actually run the ch child block. So we make a new child scope and then we evaluate the default block. The default block is this guy over here. I'll we'll come back to it soon. And then when we're done with that, we pop the child scope. So we had pushed the scope that is, uh, it's basically the current scope plus the contact. It's this thing, right? So it's the current scope plus contact. Um, something worth pointing out, let me just grab a thing here, is that normally if I have a template that looks like, you know, with foo as bar, and then inside of that, I go like uh, with baz, uh, like if I do this, you might think that each one of these things creates a child scope, and that's actually how it did work in Glimmer 1. Um, in Glimmer 2, we actually, because we know for sure that these things are not loops, mm -hmm. uh, because again, these things have to compile into an opcode that is either an enter list or not. Uh, because we know these things are not loops, we just store one slot in the parent scope for all of these individual names. And that even works if you repeat bar, right? Basically what will happen now is that internally this gets treated like a completely different variable and we create a slot for each one of these things. And that way we, that way we don't have to make child scopes. We can basically, this opcode of push child scope basically only needs to exist for loops where because of the fact that we have this contact name is used in indeterminate number of times. Mm -hmm. So in the case where something is used several times, that's fine. But if it's used an indeterminate number of times, then we want to keep reusing the slot, which means we basically have to make a child scope that is only there to, uh, to be used for that contact name, right? Okay. So basically, usually we don't have any need for child scopes where we can have one scope that has slots for each child thing. Mm -hmm. But for loops, because there's an unknown number of them, we need an extra piece of storage for it. Uh, okay, so we're pushing scope, and then now we're at the end. Uh, exit is basically the pair of enter, and that basically means close off the opening block, which means that if we, uh, specifically that means that in the case where we remove all the contacts, and therefore there is, it becomes empty, we know that the correct thing to do is to remove the DOM, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's what that's doing. Um, and so we exit, and then we point, we jump to 49.36, which is uh, back to the beginning, back to the iteration, right? So we're back, and we're gonna keep going. Eventually, we are going to find that there's nothing to iterate, and so we're going to end up jumping to the end, which is the same place in this case as we would have jumped if there was nothing. Uh, if there was an else clause, we would have had an additional p block of opcodes that were just for that else clause. So, uh, and I guess I'll talk about this, but then I, the updating opcodes is actually the more interesting bits here. So, the block, the block, the inner block is basically more or less very similar to what you have already seen, but it has. Uh, it binds the positional argument, so you gave it a context, so it needs to bind it into its local scope, and that's the top place where it's binding it into that child scope that we created. Um, it creates some blob of text, and then it has some opcodes that are associated with components, um, which we will probably get to eventually, but it, this is basically the way components work. Uh, then it opens the HR as a primitive element, and it closes the element. Uh, important thing to note here is that if you look at the original wire format, uh, both H card and HR were open element. But if you look at the opcodes, you'll see that op uh, H card became this block of opcodes and HR became this one. And that's because on the precompiler, we don't actually know what things are components yet. Mm -hmm. So we're basically le letting it be triage later. Right. But as soon as we actually compile it for real, we're in the real environment, we can check and we say, oh, it's a component. So please admit the component related opcodes. Yep. Uh, when we did the first uh, HTML virus deep dive uh, eight months ago or so, um, you described, you know, realizing, you come up with this new strategy where you could imagine a cursor actually drawing the yep. DOM, right? Yep. And for many reasons, yep. it's much faster. This VM, when it runs in this mode, is that basically yes. just Yes, yes, exactly. So the append mode, let me not say that. The append mode uh, is working against this thing called element stack, um, which element stack has a bunch of operations on it, like push element, pop element, uh, open element, append text, append comment, set attribute, set attribute ns, close element, and that's basically all those opcodes are eventually calling into those mm -hmm. things. Okay, uh, and basically the, all the extra work here is related to block tracking, so that we can, and it's, it's not a very a large expensive amount of work, it's actually basically never shows up in profiles, but it's the work that is needed to track what things to remove later, right. if we need to. 
So okay. In, in addition to the DOM that's actually built, there's like things that wrap certain elements. Yeah. So that. that so that's like that's the updating opcode part. Okay. Right. So basically, uh, I didn't spend time on this because basically we it would be very repetitive. But when you call open component uh, component definition, open component, close component, it is basically repeating that whole process for all of these opcodes. So this is a big list of them. And remember, there's a loop. So there's a lot of them. Uh, what happens in like basically the output of running these opcodes is first of all this DOM and you can observe it as HTML but second of all it also emits a bunch of what we call updating opcodes. The updating opcodes is what happens when I press the update button. So if I press the updating button obviously if I've made no changes at all it nothing happens. If I go in here and run and change this again back to John and press the update button again then it changes. So how does that actually work? So the way that it works is that on the initial append, we produce these, the, uh, we run these top level opcodes, the, sorry, the initial update appending opcodes, we run the appending opcodes, and then that each appending opcode is allowed to emit an updating opcode. So let me give you a very simple example of this. Um, if I go to, if I go to uh, append opcode, What you will see is that there, here's the evaluation for that. And inside of here, it says, if the thing that I'm putting into the DOM is not constant, and that's the thing we might talk about later. Uh, so if something is constant, there's no reason to update it. But if it's not constant, then update, uh, create a new updating opcode for the current cache, the bounds, the area of the DOM that I was talking about, and upsert, which is basically just an abstraction that is for uh, different kinds of appending. So you can append a text node, you could append HTML with triple curlies, you could append a DOM node, actually helpers can return DOM nodes. So there's a lot of different things that you could append and this thing is just allowing you to express it's something that appends something. Um, if you look at upsert, uh, it's basically like a abstract class for that, can, that has many implementations. Like here's the text version of it, for example. So the text version of it eventually will run this updating code if you're, if you're updating text. So, okay, so that was just a, uh, like, whenever you run an uh, uh, opcode, the opcode is allowed to emit an updating opcode. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's a nice property here, which is that we could do things like runtime constant checking. Uh, by the way, the most common reason why you have a constant value is because you have, is not because it came from JavaScript, but because you actually typed a constant, a static value into HTML bar. So, for example, if I go back here, and instead of, saying person equals contact, if I said, actually this is not going to work very well, but if I said like uh, P and then I said uh, con, uh, trying to think of a good way to do this, actually I can do a cheat. I can say like with Yehuda as name, right, and then I can go name. I'll put a P around it so it doesn't look stupid in the DOM. So I can write this, but of course you can observe that that Yehuda is not, cannot change. There's literally no way for that to change. Now if you look at, the, if I render it and look at it, you will see that there's a Yehuda there. But you will, and you can also observe that in the text code, it just has, an, it doesn't know what name is. And some of this we could possibly do better in the precompiler, but in the current state of the precompiler, it's like I literally have no idea what name actually is. It's confusing to me. And so it emits Yehuda, but by the time, and so we actually, and we actually go to make the opcode for it. We have a thing that is, uh, where is the actual Yehuda? It's gonna, uh, so basically we have, uh, give, bind the name positional parameter, emit some text, open a P, and then print, print the value of name, like put the value of name and then append it and then close the element. So basically this is doing the work that's inside of that, that's here. Like that's what those opcodes are emitting. And you, if you go to look at the caution, cautious append opcode, so if you go look at cautious append, you will see that it actually is able, has an updating code, right? It actually has the ability to update because as far as the underlying opcodes are concerned, it has no idea whether this thing is constant or not. However, because of the fact that it actually came from a string in the real world, but it will actually not emit an updating opcode. Um, and I don't know how to exactly find proof of that, 
quickly because of how many small things there are. But basically that constant code that we looked at before, the is constant check. So this is constant check is basically saying if the thing I'm trying to put in the DOM is, not, is constant, then don't bother doing any of this work. Yeah. And in this case, basically any string literal, any Boolean literal, number literal, whatever that came from handlebars is automatically converted into a constant reference, yeah. no matter whether, even though in this case it is used in a conceptually dynamic way. So are there further optimizations here? Is there a difference between the, uh, the, the outputted uh, render upcodes? Um, and just putting Yehuda in a paragraph. So uh, you could, I, you can imagine, and, I, and we will actually do this. That eventually we will be able to figure out very early that this whole thing inlines into this. Yeah. So this is actually a weird example, and it's kind of like the if true optimization. More likely uh, cases where this I think will happen in the real world are, let's say you have some, uh, let's say you have a thing which is your your FA icon. Uh, component and your FA icon looks like I class equals font awesome FA slash um, icon and let's say the way that's uh, sometimes so this is my application let's say the way you know sometimes you invoke that as uh, FA icon I'm using syntax that is future syntax but whatever um, Let's say you normally say, sometimes you say like icon equals model dot icon or something. In this case, it is, you know, impossible to do anything. You have to actually just wait till runtime. But imagine if I instead said FA icon icon equals bug. What you can see is that this code actually knows that it's static, but this code had to be written generically. And so the idea is that if, if at the time that we're compiling it, we can see that the parameter is constant, then we can basically just go in for that exact site and replace that with icon. And then now we can look at the whole thing and say, oh, there's no actual dynamic values anymore. Yeah. So just at compile time, replace that entire invocation yeah. site with the thing that we're doing. So this would be true of uh, the component helper, yeah. partials, yes. things like that. It's, right. it, so we're already right now working on uh, making the things like the component helper and partials uh, automatically be static if they can be. Mm -hmm. I think, were you the one who wrote about I, this? I, uh, I, no, I, there was an issue there and I tried to... Yes, and uh, I was like, please wait. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, the thing that you're talking about is like you can have, if you write like partial something, we actually don't know what it is. It's actually quite expensive because we have to, partials are especially crazy. Partial, may, you can basically in your head rewrite it to eval. Um, However, if you actually know exactly what thing you're doing, then you can just replace the entire, this invocation site with the contents of the partial. And because of the weird, the eval semantics of partials, that will be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually just do this rewriting like as AST rewriting or something like that. However, the, I think the point that you're getting at is that you can actually have foo, but maybe you, that foo actually came from a static site somewhere else. So yeah. the point is that we're, this example is showing that we're tracking constantness of values, not just of like syntax, not just a yeah. syntactic thing. Yeah. And what, if we know that something is a, a constant value, then the first step where we uh, run the append side opcodes, they, the, they all have a way of saying, if this thing, only do the appending step if it's not constant. Yeah. And the idea basically is that that lets you write very abstract um, components or partials or whatever thing you're trying to do. And at runtime, if it turns out that you're using it, you happen to be using it in a static way, then we can do very good optimizations. Okay. So the updating opcodes, this is basically the entire program that gets run whenever you re-render. Um, there's a couple of like somewhat interesting things here, and then I think we can just jump into some code. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the way I was ta I talked a lot before about these enter and exit markers. The enter and exit markers basically produce these try opcodes, and try opcodes always have inside of them one assertion. And the assertion basically is what it does is it checks to see that the value that it is expecting is the same as the value that it was before. Um, that's like a somewhat abstract thing, but you can imagine, for example, that, um, let's say for an if statement, so can I switch this to handlebars? So you can imagine that it's like if foo, uh, the assertion in this case is basically that this thing is still truthy, right? And in fact, that is what is happening here. You can see there's an assertion here that expect that we expect this value to still be true. Um, in this case, in this case, each also has the same if-like semantics. So we're expecting specifically that the uh, evaluating whether an, the iterator is empty is still 
not true. It's right. still false. So this true value, this is uh, there's a reference that wraps this yep. value and it has internal caching and stuff like that. Yep. Because so we're going to dig into that at some point. Yes. Yeah, so I th I believe that it is a conditional reference. Uh, I can actually just go to the each code. So this is like how a how the each syntax gets compiled. So at the top, there's like a more like a traditional uh, assembler like structure. And then this is basically the DSL for how it works. I actually just recently wrote a like significantly clean this up. Let me actually I think it would probably be good to it would probably be good to look at it because it significantly simplifies understanding how it works. Uh, it's like better something, better opcode, smarter block DSL. There we go. So we're looking for each TS. Yeah, as you can see, that is much more. Um, so basically, uh, it gets compiled into like here's a block. It puts the iterator, and if you look at uh, put iterator, there is matches this thing, right? So the previous things are all part of the block DSL. Sorry, here's the block DSL. And then it says, if there's an inverse template, then uh, jump to the else clause, otherwise jump to the end clause. And then it, there's an inner loop, basically, that takes the templates and push the child scope, evaluate the fault, pop scope. That's actually all really similar to what we saw before, right? Um, and then we jump to the end. And then if there's an inverse, then we actually emit the else clause here, right? So that's basically how, how it's being generated. Um, and every single one of these opcodes is allowed to produce uh, an assertion. And I think the evaluate block, the evaluate opcode is the one that actually does it here. Hmm, it is not. Uh, it's probably enter opcode. Yeah, so vm.enter basically produces a new try opcode. Like the try opcode is the updating one. It's the one that we're seeing here. Right, so this is a try opcode. vm.enter is producing the try opcode. And then it basically says, okay, I actually entered right now. So there's basically, there's two things, right? There's the enter opcode, and then later on there's a jump unless opcode. So the enter opcode is basically constructing the try, the updating try, and the jump is basically the thing that constructs the assert. So when you have a jump, you are basically like, okay, first of all, if the thing that I'm jumping it, uh, jumping because of is constant, then I'm basically done now. I, there's nothing to do here. There's no assertion. There's nothing. But if it's not constant, then make a new reference cache, which is basically the thing that, rep that knows whether things have changed or not. We'll come back to that if you wish. Yeah. Uh, and then we look inside the cache and we say, okay, if there's something inside the cache, then go back, go do the norm, the like default behavior. So this is just a default behavior or jump, which is go to the target. And then since we are not constant, then we say, okay, now update with the new assertion. Uh, if you look at assertion, so this, it's important to remember, by the way, I know this is probably gonna be confusing to some viewers. There's an appending op, uh, VM and an updating one. And so the, the jump opcode is part of the appending VM. It's what runs the first time. Mm -hmm. And the assertion opcode is part of the updating VM. It's what runs the second time. So the jump opcode in the appending side produces the assertion opcode maybe for the updating side, depending on whether the value is constant. So, uh, here's, so there's the assertion. And what you can see is that in the evaluation, what it does is it says, okay, if I am modified, then throw, vm.throw. And what throw does, if you look at it, is it basically says, okay, please go handle the exception, which in practice basically means blow away the DOM. So this is the assertion. This is the nearest try block. And in this case, if this assertion fails, it basically blows away the entire updating opcode list and starts over. The only time that that actually happens is if the each list becomes empty. So I can actually do that. And now you can understand something. If I make the each list empty and call update, what you will see is it actually did blow away all the opcodes and now there's an assertion, but instead of expected true, it's expected false and there's no DOM at all, right? And it wouldn't, it doesn't matter. So if I go back here, it doesn't actually matter if this is empty or null or something like that because uh, the semantics of lists in Glimmer are that empty lists are false for the purpose of the each loop, mm -hmm. right? So in other words, the semantics of the loop is not whether the value is null, it actually becomes an iterator. The value, the semantics are, are there any items in the iterator? If I start iterating, do I immediately get a I am done? 
Yeah. And if the answer is I immediately get an I am done, that means it's empty and that basically causes the entire thing to blow away. Okay. So let's get back to the real version. So anyway, the point is that the, op the enter opcode produces a try and the jump opcodes produce an assert. And the asserts basically are just saying whether or not you should blow away the parent. Um, list block, like I said, is the primitive list thing. And each, uh, there's a try inside of the list block and then there's, um, there's more things. Um, I, can't, I will not actually have time to go through all the things, but I, I want to say a few things that are interesting here. Um, so I, I probably am not going to have time to really go into components, unfortunately, although they use a lot of the same concepts. But one of the things that's pretty cool is that every component, so this try is actually associated with the component, the H card component, and jump if not modified is actually doing, uh, if you know React, is doing should component update automatically for you. The, basic, the way that this works is that whenever you render something into DOM and you create a component node at the top, the component node is basically uh, um, absorbing any references that are created directly underneath it or anywhere underneath it. And it creates one like mega validation for all of the things that are below it. And this jump if not modified is basically saying, you can basically skip this entire area. You can skip directly to 14805, which I can try to find probably somewhere around here. It's here. You can skip this entire area if this particular thing, if nothing inside of this thing has changed. So uh, because basically we make break everything down into uh, references for the thing that's actually going to DOM, right? So every, anything that goes into DOM has to be a string, ultimately. So because we break everything down into references that go into DOM, we can actually look at any particular group of, of things and say, what are all the inputs into this subgraph, subtree over here? And then we can say, are any of them invalid? If none of them are invalid, we can just skip this entire area and we don't have to compute anything. And that's actually pretty nice. So if you look at the updating opcodes for components, you will often see jump if not modified, and that's basically doing should component update for you. Yeah. So the the reference validator system that seems like something that's important, uh, yes. something that's new, right? I and should talk about it. Yeah. So uh, references, if you're familiar with Ember before, are actually the natural codification of the stream story in Glimmer One. Um, the stream story was a very pragmatic story. It was whatever we needed to make things work, composable enough. Uh, but when we started working on Glimmer 2, and I, I don't remember if this was already there when I started, when I talked to you last time. Uh, no, no, there, there was, uh, yeah. There, I, well, it certainly didn't touch upon it in the uh, screencast we did. So I'm not, there has to have been something that replaced streams, but I don't know. It might have been a very, very simplified version of this story. Right. So the cool thing about references is that I mean, what, what are streams? So stream, I, it's actually going to be hard for me to talk about it in terms of all that, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give a quick answer. Mm -hmm. So quickly, streams are um, a thing that represents a value coming from somewhere else and being shuttled to, you know, coming from a source and being shuttled to a sync. Right. Um, the main thing that all Ember stream-like abstractions have tried to do for a long time uh, has been to support some amount of pull-based stuff. So. If you look at, for example, Rx observables, which are like the popular stream abstraction in JavaScript, those observables are fundamentally push-based. And in fact, their composition story relies on them being push-based. Uh, in the sense that they are comp you can do a lot more things with push-based because nothing is being dropped. However, uh, and the reason why that, like, the reason that could be nice, for example, is if you are uh, getting an observable of like mouse moves, you do not want to let, you need to get them right away so you can do something with them. You can't afford to like drop a mouse move on the floor because you weren't ready to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And what does it even mean to pull a mouse move? That doesn't make any sense, right? So basically a lot of the examples that people use for observables are really about push-based signaling. Mm -hmm. And references are uh, trying to deal with the fact that when you're actually com uh, putting things into the DOM, you can only put things into the DOM at some speed, and the basically the best, the maximum speed is 60 FPS, 60 times a second. But faster than 60 FPS is actually a bad idea. It actually, uh, you're using more CPU than the human eye can see. And additionally, uh, if you are trying to flush whatever changes happened ev only once every 17 milliseconds, then you actually want to, you want to have a way of coalescing all the changes that have happened into basically one big update. So 
in that from that perspective, it's actually much nicer to have a system where you can say, what is the current value of the thing I'm trying to put into the DOM? Mm -hmm. And so streams and uh, streams and references both take the perspective that well, you would rather ask for values when you need them than get values pushed at you at any random time. Yeah. So, uh, and and imp another important thing is that all versions of Glimmer ever, uh, since early Glimmer 1, have taken the perspective that the right way to revalidate the universe is to walk the existing tree from the top down. But one of the nice properties of that is that if you start removing something from the DOM, that whole subtree disappears and you don't have to walk into it. But of course, if the values are getting pushed at you, you have to do something every single time the value is pushed at you, even though you might be talking about a piece of the DOM that goes away later. Right? So you might have a thing that's like, you know, if the user is, like let's say a geolocation app, if the user is still in range of his house, let me update something about where they are on the screen. Now imagine that the user actually, you ha get a bunch of updates that you would like to do, but then before you apply them, the user actually leaves the range. Now there's no point in actually having done all the computation to show something involved, right? So basically the idea is that uh, pull-based allows you to, it's not only scheduling when you apply things, it allows you to schedule them in a priority order that is based on the DOM tree that mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. So that, this has always been an idea that we have had. Um, the Ember object model itself actually weirdly has always been push-based. And you can tell that if you use observers. Observers are always synchronous. They give you values right away. So streams awkwardly tried to deal with this problem by observing values and then con like basically caching just the value right away. And then the pull would be the thing that actually computed whatever value that you needed. But the thing that was unfortunate about that that actually caused the slowdown, or it caused the non-gain. Slowdown was caused by this thing that me made this not as nice as you would have expected is that you have to actually register the observers. The observers are actually granular push-based observers. So you, you basically have to deal with a pull-based system and also a push-based system. And that just that is an example of something where actually trying to, like Glimmer 1 had a nice story because it was very pull-based, but it, when we tried to integrate it with Ember, which is push-based, all of a sudden we ended up getting all the overhead back that we thought we had gotten rid of. Yeah. So, so that's basically why push versus pull is a thing. Um, however, there's a problem with pull-based. So if you, the idea behind pull-based is, okay, I will, I'm going to revalidate the DOM top-down. And this is like more or less the story you hear from the basic React story, right? I'm going to revalidate the DOM from the top-down, right? And every single time I hit a thing, a computation, I'll just recompute it and check if it's the same. And if not, I will just not do anything. And the argument is something like DOM is fast. It's the DOM is the bottom, that DOM is slow. JavaScript is fast, so it's fine. But in, in reality, and there is a reason React has should component update, in reality, there are some sizes of DOM that exist in the real world, and this is especially true in mobile, where it is not actually true that the JavaScript is that fast. The JavaScript may be slow, and this is especially problematic if you're trying to hit 60 FPS because you, in practice, have like five milliseconds to do your JavaScript code, and make, there's, it's actually possible that it is, it is literally impossible to recompute your entire tree from the top down in that amount of milliseconds. Right. So what that basically means is that you, you're do, you have this nice story where you're revalidating from the top down, you get the benefits of, you know, you can nuke entire subtrees, everything works great. But n the actual act of revalidating from the top down might actually, uh, with a certain size DOM, become untenable to do within certain timing guarantees that you would like to have. Yeah. And the React solution to that problem is a thing called should component update. And the idea there is that you, as a user, write a should component update function and you basically say, I happen to know that the entire subtree over here is only based on these inputs, yeah. so I, or whatever inputs you care about, and you say, as long as these things didn't change, I can be sure this other stuff didn't change, so you can basically skip it. Yeah. Um, for regular JavaScript, this is actually quite hard to know, because there's many, like, mutability is a thing, you, it's hard to know if you've done the right thing, if the subtree is actually based on inputs, and there's actually an even worse problem, which is that once you start composing other people's code inside of your code, or there's multiple people working on something, uh, you can imagine that someone thought that it was based on these inputs, but someone deep down started using flux, and they actually have become dependent on some like out of band thing. Yeah. So the point is that every time you write chicken bond update, you have to actually be very confident that the data going all the way down from every point from the top down is actually coming only from the the inputs that you were checking. Yeah. And that's somewhat tricky. A solution to this problem in the React ecosystem is to only use immutable data structures anywhere in your program and uh, immutable data structures and also have your entire state of your entire, uh, of all the DOM inputs come from the same tree. And that way you can actually be sure, for sure, that nobody below you started using a different system mm -hmm. of state tracking. 
and now you can actually write automatically write should clone update which is think what things like redux do or like ohm right but that also means that you have to use immutable data structures everywhere throughout your program yeah. so are you saying uh, that the reference system allows us to automatically capture all of the dependent values and yep. wrap it up into a single reference which we can very easily check and yes so it, it's auto should component yes. update auto should component update is the thing that godfrey wrote in the commit uh, the imp the way to understand this is uh, in Ember, every single th like every single thing that goes into every single thing that goes into the DOM, like this thing, is going into the DOM at a, at the primitive layer. It's going in as a text node, and it has it knows exactly what its dependency is. And no nothing can actually enter. This is not JavaScript code. It's Glimmer code. So nothing, no value can be referenced without it being treated as a reference. Yeah. I actually didn't get to the main point yet because so f so I can say why the, this doesn't should not seem satisfying yet. Um, so all these things are treated as references and what that means is that for any block we can actually look at all the inputs we for sure we know what the inputs are and we can as you say coalesce them into a single validation check and then we can do the right thing the reason this should not yet seem that satisfying to you is because if you are just trying to do the react strategy the validation check has to be to recompute all the values and then check to see if they're equal which is not any better than the thing we did before and in fact, that is a true characteristic of the most simple way to use Glimmer, which is that you, what we call volatile references, you, mm -hmm. all your references are volatile, they can change at any time, and every single time you ask if it's up to date, it will always tell you no, no, it is not up to date, and you have to recompute. In fact, that actually works just fine for small, like any React app that would not need should component update is gonna work just fine with volatile DOMs, and actually more, because the Ember story, the Ember story automatically does not worry about any static bits. So the virtual DOM, of course, has to recompute all the yep. whole DOM. Um, I can give you a very, like, a quite simple way of, like, it's annoying that the updating outputs are so big, but if I said, like, um, what's the top level? Contacts. So if I said, like, uh, if contacts, then, uh, like, I don't know if this will work, but I will try. Uh, let's say I do this. Mm, doesn't like it. Um, I can. I'll just change the data. So I say if contact, then print it. Mm, doesn't like it. Don't know why. Uh, I wonder if you're just not allowed to change the template there. Ah, that's probably it. That basically you you can change the data but not the template in the visualizer. Yeah. yeah it actually right. makes true. actually yeah. makes sense. Uh, so if contact print it. So actually now you have a much simpler <laughs> set of updates. So you have actually quite a involved. I should actually have put in some DOM because that's the point I was trying to make. Ah. Uh, there's like reset and there's right. edit and I should have done. It's not the first time that that's happened. Nope. Yeah, this is a visualizer. This is not Ember, just so you know. I'm actually pretty, like, it's funny because the visualizer is not perfect, but it's like way better than other stuff I've used to work on problems like this before. So I'm like, seems great. So anyway, you uh, if we, if we look back at this example, right? It's a you get if there's a contact, then run block zero. Block zero has a text element, an open P, an append of contact, which doesn't know what it is yet, close element, and more text nodes. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the top level opcodes actually are enter, label, put the arguments for contacts, test the operand, jump unless, evaluate the default thing, here's another label, here's exit. But the updating opcodes are actually quite small. right? So if you look here, you'll see that there's a Yehuda. The updating opcodes are quite small. There's a try opcode, then there's an assertion that the contact is still truthy, and then if the assertion, and then there's a, uh, which, would on, which would fail if this thing became false, right, if the if condition flipped. And then there's a cautious update, which basically means to not uh, escape it. Mm -hmm. uh, cautious update, which basically means uh, check to see if the same, if Yehuda is still the same as the last value, and if it is not the same, then update it. So if, for example, I wrote Yehuda exclamation point over here and ran update, it would change 
but all it had to run to determine that is this small set of yeah. opcodes, yeah. right? So uh, I don't remember why I said that. Uh, you were comparing it to React. Oh, right. So I, th this is not, so far, not that interesting. Um, it just means that the total amount of things that you have to do to build the quote unquote virtual DOM, which as you can see does not exist in Ember. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that is the thing people can take away here is that you should not assume that Ember has a virtual DOM. This is not, this this is not how it works at all. But the number of revalidations that you have to do in React includes uh, the static things. Now React, if you talk to React people, they will always tell you, oh, we have like Babel based optimizations, whatever. And there's a certain amount of that that's true, but fundamentally the, the render function in React actually involves some code that has to generate the, the value and that thing is producing a tree and that tree has parent nodes and child nodes that are not able to be constant. So there is some amount of extra work that you have to do no matter what uh, in React. And again, this is not that interesting. It just means that there's some constant factor by which Ember's most boring version of the work is smaller. Yep. However, there's another thing, which is the real story, which is that in addition to, you know, if everything is volatile, it's just like a better thing. It has a better revalidation story mm -hmm. if everything is, but things cannot be volatile. Now, the nice thing about the, the like validation story is that it's not particularly coupled to any kind of object model, any story. Uh, for example, if you had frozen data in like immutable data in React, you could actually say that the revalidation is always true because it, you know for a fact that this is like a value that can never change ever. And actually that's how the static values in the template work, right? So sometimes we have values that are always true and that could come from Ember or it could come from, I happen to use an object model that has that characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, or you might be using an Ember-like object model which has set in, setters and getters or like Vue.js has a similar story. And in that story, what you can do is you, instead of having to observe any changes, you can have any setters bump the internal count Right. So uh, every time I set something on, a, on an object, I remember that this object was last changed at count 47. And uh, later on, when I want to see if it's valid, all I have to do is remember what the last count that I saw was for that object. Yep. And that means that there's a pretty fast way of checking to see for a lot of objects whether things changed. Um, and uh, and it, you can also intermix these things, right? So you can say uh, this this code all uses immutable JS, but I have a few things that use. Uh, that use this other kind of thing. Um, you can also do dirty checking as an intermixing, right? So you, uh, maybe you're like, I have this whole thing uses immutable JS, but this one thing is like totally out of my control. It can change at will and I have no way of intercepting it. You can basically say this particular thing is validated by actually just checking the triple equals quality of the value or whatever rules that you want. And we can basically, because the validator itself is composable, right? You're basically checking all the validations. You can compose them all into one validator that is either very, it could be very fast if it's immutable JS and it's literally no check, composes into a constant, like any amount of constant uh, validators compose into one constant validator, so that's great. Um, if it's Ember, it's basically math.max on the entire, on the list, right? So you ask for all the, the tickets, which is basically the last known updating count, yeah. and then you math.max all those, and then you check to see if that's uh, newer than the last time you checked that whole thing. And that's math max is quite cheap. Yeah. Uh, but if you are doing like a, a f harder thing uh, where you ha where you don't know if something might have changed, then you can start doing more complicated things. But the system still works. Basically, mm -hmm. the the shift component update system it just gets more expensive as you opt into things that are more or less constant. Right. The more stable your code is, the more you can make things nice. The less stable your code is, the less yeah. you can make things nice. Uh, there are some good docs on this in the yeah, Glimmer architecture, right? Yes. So we actually need to do more, and I think we're we're like going to start doing some more. But um, there's these docs are like the main ones. Uh, you can see that we have plans to do a lot more. But ref basically, references and validators goes into what is a reference and what is a validator. Um, at a very high level, the reference is the thing that gives you values back, so it represents values. And the important thing about that is that because you can have you know you can have arbitrary expressions, you could have foo.bar.baz, but you could also have like, you know, and foo.bar, you can have stuff like this, right? So a reference is basically however complicated expression you happen to have used, it will convert it into a single reference that you can get the value of. And then a reference is responsible for producing a validator. And the validator is, uh, the rule for validator is that you're always allowed to say invalid, but you're not allowed to say valid unless you're really sure. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is that uh, every reference type can produce a 
uh, validator for its type for co constant ones. The, if the reference actually came from the syntax, then the it's always a constant reference. You get back a constant validator and have a nice day. Um, you can always start writing your code using the volatile, uh, the volatile validator. But if you use the volatile validator, that basically de-optimizes all the should component update optimizations because that means that literally nothing is ever valid. Yeah. Right for that entire subtree, it's actually kind of nice that it only pollutes that subtree. Mm -hmm. But it does mean like any sibling subtrees are fine. Yeah. But it does mean that it's a somewhat dangerous thing to use. But it's a nice starting point. And then when you pull in, like basically the idea is that if you want to add support for immutable JS to Glimmer, you can start off by assuming something boring. You can even assume volatile, and it will work. Uh, you have to say that when you like the way that you get paths, right? So you have to say what this means for an immutable object, and you might want to say it's dot get or something like that. Or maybe there's like a global function that does it for you, uh, like immutable dot get or whatever. Um, but what you would like to do is also integrate the validator system. So you can say that basically if this immutable child is part of this immutable parent, it shares one validator for that entire immutable thing. Um, and maybe like if, some, if something is frozen, uh, like if an immutable subtree is there may be a difference between I have an immutable thing that I'm planning on replacing parts of and getting a new parent that I'm reparenting. So you, an example would be like you have a component, right? There's a difference between um, I have some immutable thing here and I'm like expecting, let me change this to JavaScript. There's a difference between like I am, uh, like I'm expecting to replace this over time and I don't know what this API is, it's like immutable of whatever, where I am, it's like never expected to be replaced, right? Obviously in this case, the immutable subtree, uh, you, o you only have to worry about its validation once for the entire subtree. So if you revalidated any part of it, you have revalidated the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite nice. But if you also know for a fact that it's not, not only is it only gonna change atomically, you also know that it can only change, that it's never gonna change for sure. Then you can just say that it's constant. Um, right now, Glimmer doesn't have a public API in something like the Ember layer for saying that things are constant, but you, it seems good that you should be allowed to say that. Um, I think the most obvious way to imagine doing that is if you make the property non-configurable, then if you make the property non-configurable and the thing that's inside of it is itself immutable, then the whole thing is immutable. Yeah. So some of these things you're talking about are more for integrating Glimmer with other projects, right? There's yes. going to be a default strategy for uh, uh, Angular yes. based on the get and set, right? Yes, exactly. So basically Glimmer integrating with, Glimmer has a few strategies that it comes with. One of them is the constant one for cases where either Ember or Glimmer itself knows that something is constant for some reason. Mm -hmm. Actually, the most obvious cases for that other than the syntax are like helper functions cannot change. Now, in principle, you might be willing to allow them to change, yeah. uh, but in practice in Ember, there is no actual way to express that, so we are allowed to say they're constant, and that allows us to do more optimizations. Um, but yes, the idea is that people should be allowed to write Redux or other immutable JS strategies using Ember, and the integration point would be writing the reference and validator implementation for that data type. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Um, so there's a couple of other things that are in the Glimmer repository, and um, like there's an object model in there. There's mix-ins. There's computer properties. Um, yep. What's the story? What's the story <laughs> with that? Uh, so the story with that is that you should not use it. Um, the reason that they exist is because, uh, as I've said a few times, the goal for Glimmer is to not be itself coupled to Ember. But unlike Glimmer one, it actually is important that Glimmer itself understands what Ember is doing. Uh, so instead of saying, oh, we'll just like assume that references and validators are like the right thing, uh, or we're, we'll assume that you know, the path thing will be correct, we, uh, we want it to be sure or feel confident, and we didn't want to have to do that by pulling in all of Ember. Um, another, there's another characteristic of this, which is that we also wanted to experiment with a pull-based version of the Ember model. So the Ember as I said before, the thing that's somewhat annoying about the Ember observable story is that the Ember observable story is push-based, and Glimmer doesn't actually use that at all. As I said before, the actual thing that Glimmer does is uh, whenever you set something, it bumps a counter on the object, and then we check that counter, which is actually, it's actually a pretty nice improvement that Glimmer gives you that has nothing to do with, it's basically observers are eliminated, 
but you didn't think about that at all, right? Like basically your own observers, of course, still exist, they still work, but most of the cases of observers in the programming model are gone, even though they still exist on the objects, because almost all the cases of observers in Glimmer 1 were actually observing objects for components, but now components never observe, they have a reference and they ch track to see whether their value got bumped. So that's actually great. Uh, the thing that's in the Glimmer repo is more of an experiment for like, can we implement the entire thing purely as a pull-based thing, yeah. including all the validation semantics, because then you can basically, if you say a computer property is actually a reference, right? If you think about it, a computer property is basically a reference, mm -hmm. but it's, it has some legacy semantics. The question is, if you can make a computer property actually a reference, then you also don't have to create another one just to wrap that computer property. You can just use the computer property reference that already exists. Yeah. And, I, and so the idea was basically to explore that kind of stuff Pretty early on, we descoped all of that work from Land and Glimmer. Yeah. I think originally I was thinking, oh, maybe we can land that at the same time. But first of all, I am now unconvinced that it's even the right code. I think it's the right direction, but I don't think it's the right code. Right. Um, so it's sort of serving two purposes. One of them was like, does it? Is there? If you look at it, you'll see that. If interestingly, if you look at the code, you'll see that there's tests, and they're like basically the Ember tests. There, it's like a copy paste of many of the Ember tests. And so the idea was for me, for me to explore whether the pull-based model made sense with the, with the Ember object model. I, I can tell you, frankly, the reason it did not succeed is, is actually has nothing to do with any of the semantics that you are expecting to use and everything to do with really legacy semantics like ember.defined property. Uh, so I did some stuff like whenever you say ember.extend, ember.extend, I create a pre-shaped meta, all this stuff. And basically made it so that most of the work was done upfront with Ember dollars that extend and very like much less work at runtime. But the Ember semantics are actually based on Ember.defined property, which is less about making entire classes and more about defining property at a time, which is actually pretty symmetrical to the problem with optimizing JavaScript in the first place, which is that most people actually use JavaScript as a, in a shapey way, mm -hmm. but there's enough usage of JavaScript in a per property way that it makes it hard to optimize. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the fact that I didn't want to actually make ember.defined property the core value of the new object model, but I also couldn't remove it. And I was basically like, at this point, I don't really know what's up. And I basically will we'll come back to it. In the meantime, Chris has done amazing work to make the object model in Ember itself better. Uh, we've learned a lot about how V8 and other engines want to optimize things. So I think my expectation is that the work to make pull-based work uh, in the object model will still happen, but it will happen more incrementally in terms of the existing object model. Yeah. And it's still great that we have a thing that looks like the Ember object model for testing integration without pulling in the whole Ember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's next? So, pro so probably what is, I can say what's now. Um, what's now is that everybody, I should just bring up the um, Glimmer preflight checklist. It's actually pretty, it's pretty fun to look at this, at all these things, because you will be reminded of all the things that you didn't remember existed at all. Um, it's funny, it's very easy, it's very uh, tempting to just be like, oh, that doesn't really matter. We, it would be a lot easier if we didn't have to worry about compatibility, but if, if you, uh, is it a hyphen? Do author chat, you'll kind of... Here we go. Um, it, it's pretty tempting to say that it doesn't, like, you don't have to worry about it, but of course, every time you break the entire ecosystem, you have, you have broken the entire ecosystem. So, I, basically, my feeling is if it takes an extra month or two to make everything perfectly compatible, mm -hmm. then that's a month or two that we have spent getting everyone who was already in Ember using Ember. Yeah. That seems clearly worth it to me, yeah. uh, even though it's, like, easy to imagine that you can just nuke it. So, basically, the Glimmer Preflight Checklist is the current status. Um, these are, so, this feed, this list used to be a lot bigger. This is all the features that people are working on. You can see that there's actually only one feature on the big picture feature list that is not done now. In, and we have supported things like render and send action and these features that don't even exist in Ember really, except that they snuck in in 2.0. Um, local lookup, which is a feature that hasn't even landed as a really a public API in Ember, right? So a lot of things have landed. I actually don't know why that's not, I actually do know why that's not done. Someone was asking me about it. So this is the big picture stuff. I think that's, we're like done, basically. And then there's a big list of uh, all the tests that if you run the test suite are failing right now. And you can see a lot of them have been made to pass. Um, and Chad did a good job of breaking these up. So I actually, I, ah, all the render t uh, test failures have to do with a very obscure feature of render where you can render, use the render keyword in a panel or template and then say render into, 
from your outlet and expect something to happen. I honestly could not even tell you what is supposed to happen there, but uh, there is some set of tests that are testing that behavior. It's an example of like, we have to make it actually work. Um, actually, the cool thing about Glimmer, Glimmer 1 was like this, but Glimmer 2 is more like this, is that it's never like, oh, can we implement that? Like Glimmer itself is so flexible that we can always implement whatever. It's more like, I really would like to ship. So we have right. to ship. <laughs> Uh, this cruft that can be removed is basically Chad assuming that these tests don't matter. They're like old tests testing some internal thing that doesn't really matter uh, for some reason. Um, like components should receive the view registry from the parent view. Like that's talking about the interaction of several internal APIs, which probably doesn't matter. Um, real world apps is also like a pretty important thing, but I think may some of it may happen after the alpha. So uh, Ember Twiddle works and simple apps work, which is great. Uh, this is basically does LinkedIn work and it's really close. Like. LinkedIn actually boots now and runs, but there's some things about it that don't work. Um, obviously, Ember Inspector needs to work before the beta. Um, this is like actually ship something for reals, and um, this is the this is basically like the last line there. Um, so basically, what you can observe is that we're at the tail end. Um, I think what's immediately next is getting to the real tail end and shipping, which is good. Um, I think there are going to be, after we do, after we ship Glimmer, the things that are next for Glimmer, there's two parallel tracks. Uh, one of them is making it a more suitable thing for standalone usage. So right now, uh, right now there's a pretty nice story for uh, the environment. So if you look at environment, the entire API for what it is that you need to do to implement an environment is like these abstract methods, which is pretty small. Uh, it's a little bit hiding something because the component definition is itself another thing that you have to implement and that's how base but that's the whole thing for implementing components like your component api is just implementing these hooks and then we do most of the work for you um so there's already a pretty good abstraction line and i talked about this in my talk today and yesterday is basically a nice thing about typescript is that you can actually do this and it's pretty easy to iterate on it if you make changes and make sure that all the your code matches um and I think that's pretty important for like Tom's work of trying to make standalone Glimmer a thing that makes sense for little apps, things like that. Um, and then there's, at the, in, as a parallel track, there's a bunch of optimizations that we would like to do, like the uh, inlining optimizations. Basically any optimization that you can do at, by specializing invocation sites are all things that we're like teed up to do and we just mm -hmm. don't want, I don't want to make things any more complicated for anybody until we ship. Yeah. Um, actually there's another in parallel thing which I've been working on and just have to finish which is we, I've been completely rewriting the tokenizer and parser, uh, the HTML parser. And the reason for this is to make sure to get the location information very high fidelity. So right now you can get some amount of location information out of, uh, out of the Glimmer AST, but it's especially when it involves HTML is often not quite right. And that means that it's hard to do a good job with linting. Uh, Robert has done some pretty epic work to try to reverse engineer sometimes what's going on by looking at the original source, but I would rather if that was in the AST. Right. Um, and uh, lint uh, linting, but also rewriting. So basically, uh, one of the things that we have wanted to do for so long is having good rewriting tools for handlebars so that we can say, oh, we want to upgrade bind data to this thing, just run this tool on your app. But right now, there's not enough uh, location information to give you an output that doesn't look like a pretty annoying diff. And so getting more location information in. So that's the thing I'm, I'm working on and will land soon. I think that will basically create a renaissance of linting tools, which will be nice. Yeah. Um, so it's basically those three things in parallel. And I think I'm actually pretty psyched about the optimizations because basically right now, like there are server side optimizations we can do and early client side ones. Oh, I missed an obvious thing, which is we have to make the compiler take less time. So right now the runtime compiler for very stupid reasons is just not very optimized. So it can take like, the 20 or 30 percent of run of the ren initial render times like compiling opcodes which is dumb mm -hmm. um but anyway the my expectation is that once we get to a point where we can work on optimizations we actually have teed up a bunch of really good ones and we we should be able to get to a point where people can write things like that fa icon example and know for sure like they can understand for sure that it yeah. will get the optimization and actually that's something that i care a lot about about optimizations is once we start doing them for real, I want to document like what are the fast paths so that people can predict that if they write their code in a particular way, they get the expected optimization. I don't, I understand the desire as an implementer to be like, oh, we're just going to try to do a fast thing, and that's opportunistic optimizations seem fine. Mm 
but if there's an optimization that you're getting because people are using a particular static form and that optimization is guaranteed, it is good to tell people that it's guaranteed. Yep. And I would like to do that. Yep. Uh, you uh, mentioned two talks that you gave, just so people can look them up uh, when they're available on YouTube. What were they? Uh, so one of them was the keynote at Ember Camp uh, London, which I gave with Tom, and then I basically gave the same talk again today on my own without Tom, who always makes it way more lively and interesting. Um, but it's the same talk again. I think, I suspect that the sad truth is that the video of the second one will be better than the video of the first one. The first one's already on Periscope right now, so mm -hmm. you can watch it. I think, I was watching it this morning, it's like, fine. Yeah. It's not like world-class video, but it's mm -hmm. watchable. Yeah. Um, if uh, someone has a production Ember app out there and they're excited about the Glimmer, which I'm sure they are, uh, what should they be doing now to uh, prepare for its introduction? Uh, so I think the most the most obvious thing is that when the you should keep an eye out for the alpha because once there is an alpha you will add, oh, so of course the obvious thing is be on close to right. like don't have deprecation warnings in your app although Glimmer actually isn't doing anything with deprecation warnings but really who, like some of the deprecation warnings are saying we don't really know why this works it's basically based on interaction with the internals we can observe that something is going wrong here and please try to clean it up. Uh, there's at least one example of that that has to do with uh, if you're in part of your code and you make a change to something that happened earlier in your template, we somehow can make it work in some cases, but it's hard to know exactly which cases it works in. So definitely like try to, try to be on 2.7, basically, I think is the thing. Uh, being on 2.8 beta probably doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. um, so 2.8 is a long-term release? Uh, I'm actually getting some of these details wrong. So to, the current release is 2.6. Two, right. uh, so 2.7 beta is the latest thing that you could be on right now. Um, 2.8 beta is coming out like in a couple weeks, I think, a week or two. And 2.8 beta, uh, beta is going to become the beta of the LTS. Mm -hmm. uh, but soon after 2.8 beta, I'm crossing my fingers. 2.9 Alpha will come out. 2.9 Alpha, we don't usually do them, but 2.9 Alpha is basically, it's basically Ember with, it's Canary with Glimmer, right? It's basically no extra features, nothing special, no, no crazy stuff, but Glimmer is, is crazy enough. So, so basically the correct answer for I want to try it out an app is use, unless you're really adventurous and want to build your own custom build against Canary, which you can do, but I generally feel like that will probably be a bad experience for most people. Uh, wait for 2.9 Alpha, install, use 2.9 Alpha, run against your app. Um, the reason it's an Alpha and not 2.9 Beta is because we expect, we don't know what the bugs will be, but we expect there to be some. So the test we can only test things that we already know about or had regressions, but who, it's hard to be fully sure. So test against your app, we expect that it will run against most apps. Um, one thing that I would say is if you are using a feature that is not removed yet, it is deprecated but not removed and it does not work, you should still report that because we the intent with Glimmer, unlike Glimmer 1 where it did wreaked all kinds of havoc, the intent with Glimmer 2 is that every feature that is easy to explain what it is and tested and uh, or documented and deprecated should still work. Mm -hmm. And we, so if you, if you find something not working, it may not be surprising to you because perhaps you'd be like, oh, that is a crazy feature. So that's fine. But you should definitely, before the beta, we would like to make sure that all the weird stuff works. Um, I th you'll, if you just want to test it out and want to have a good experience, not having a lot of deprecated features is probably good. Uh, actually, there's another thing about deprecated features, which is that every new iteration of the rendering engine makes some decisions about what's fast and what's slow, and deprecated features always are slow. There are always things that we say we can, we can tolerate that, that being a little slower or a lot slower. So one reason to get rid of deprecated features is that you're not going to get a good performance story you're not going to get an accurate performance story out of Glimmer 2 if you're using deprecated features. Yeah. It's probably, if you're using it a lot, you might actually get slower. Just like using width in JavaScript. At some point, it's actually making your code slower. All right. Um, that was, uh, as ever, really, really great. Um, it's very exciting technology. Um, thanks very much. No problem.